Numbers 32. I'm sorry, Numbers 32. Again, I will not read the whole chapter. It is quite lengthy. It is 42 verses. <laughs> but I will read some portions of this chapter as we progress through, or as I progress through the message. I pray we progress through it because I pray you come along with me as I go through this. But before I say anything directly concerning the context, those of you who maybe even if you're retired now or if you are not retired and you're still working out in the public, were you ever in a situation to where an individual or individuals at your place of employment, one or maybe more than one, were breaking the rules? We're not doing things according to the policy of the business for which you worked. And then, once it is discovered that this individual or individuals were not conducting themselves according to the policy, then everyone was summoned into a meeting and all were scolded because the policy was not being correctly kept. You ever had that happen to you? You ever had that happen and you wasn't the one that was breaking the policy? But you were the one following the policy? Did you feel a little angry because you had to sit through the meeting and be scolded as well as everyone else? Hmm? Our egos, our egos does not allow us to feel good in situations like that. I say that, I said that rather, to preface now what I'm about to say. I thank God for the modern contrivances that we have today. There are some who cannot make it that, that or near this local assembly that would love to be here right now this morning, that would love to be here but cannot be here because of an actual hindering cause. But I would venture to say that every one of us here this morning probably knows someone or ones, more than one, who find it quite easy to become complacent. They give lip service to belief in Jesus Christ and yet we'll make and Paul I'm glad you preached what you did no sacrifice whatsoever no sacrifice whatsoever the complacency that I see all about us concerning the viral the virus rather circumstances under which we live has made me wonder Mason, we talked a little bit about this, but made me wonder how many people give lip service to God and their hearts are far from Him. What if, what if in even this nation in which we live, what if God Almighty in His own wise sovereign purpose what if? I don't know whether it will happen or not. But if God's purpose for it to happen, it will happen. But what if God has purposed even for this country to one day martial rule comes down and we are told you will not gather at all because we think this is a danger to society. What will we do then in light of what some, not you, what some do now in complete complacency. I'm too afraid. The word of God says perfect love casteth out fear. And that's not my love for God. That's me by grace knowing his love for me. And if I believe he has perfect love for me, I got no reason to be afraid of anything or anyone. That does not mean we do not take precautions. Some of our brothers and sisters in times past had to meet in secret and hide when doing so. But bless God, Mason, they at least still did it. They at least still did it and did it under the threat of death. Death by the government. And we're afraid of a virus. Let me change that. We're not afraid of the virus. Some of us has had it. And guess what? We're still here. And if some of us yet get it, and God takes us out of this world, you know what I say? Praise be 
to God. We're done with this world. Now having said that, Numbers chapter 32. Israel, that is the nation of Israel. National Israel was one people. They were one people. They were one nation. They were one called out assembly. Israel on a national scale was called out of Egypt. Correct? We have seen this. We've come through this history thus far. Israel is called out of Egypt. But when you're called out of something by God, you are going to be called to something by God. Many gloat in the fact they think they've been called out of something, but they never have evidently, evidently, I can't see the heart, I don't know, but I must preach the truth as it is in this book, knowing the rebellion and unbelief of men. Many are, they glory in being called out of something, but they have no connection to something afterwards. Yet, yet, though, nation, though Israel was one people, one nation, one called out assembly, and they were called out into the what? The wilderness. But they had a destination to arrive at. And though because of their rebellion, they did not enter in at first. Mason, if they hadn't rebelled, they could have entered in right at first. But because of their rebellion, God kept them in the wilderness for 40 years until all the unbelievers, dead carcasses, lie in the wilderness to rot. Why? Because God is holy. But yet notice, in the midst of this stiff-necked and rebellious people, and I'm here to tell you and you and me, that's what we are too. In the midst, this thing, this stiff-necked and rebellious people, yet they were to be separated geographically by tribe one day. Were they not? This is kind of the context of Numbers chapter 32. Israel has now went through, per se, the 40 years. Thousands have died in the wilderness under God's holy severity. And now Israel is poised to enter into the, the land. But the tribe of Reuben and the tribe of Gad had lots of animals. Did you read the chapter? Lots of animals. And they realized that on the east side of Jordan, just below what is now known as Damascus, stretching all the way down to the Dead Sea, on the east side of Jordan, they realized that this land was great for animals. Great for animals. And they come to Moses and Eleazar and the princes of the congregation, and they say, grant us the request to have this land on this side of Jordan. And Moses agrees. But he gives them one stiff command. You can have the land on the east side of Jordan. And eventually it was divided between Reuben at the most southern end and Gad in the middle, and forgive me if I have this a little wrong, and the half-tribe of Manassas to the north, all on the east side of Jordan. But one thing Moses makes sure, here's one thing you best make sure, and look at what it says in verse 20. They said, we want this land over here. Moses says, that's fine, but the promised land is on that side. And the rest of your brethren are going over to that side. You could have this land over here, but you must pass over to that other side first and fight the battle of all the battles. Then you could have the possession on the other side. And he says in verse 20, <coughs> they had agreed. <coughs> they had agreed. Gad and Reuben. They are the two main ones mentioned here. There was, of course, the half-tribe of Manasseh. Verse 20, And Moses said unto them, If ye will do this thing, if ye will go to war, if ye will go armed before the Lord to war, 
and will go, all of you, armed over Jordan before the Lord, until he hath driven out his enemies from before him, and the land be subdued before the Lord. Then afterward ye shall return and be guiltless before the Lord and before Israel, and this land shall be your possession before the Lord. But if ye will not do so, behold, ye have sinned against the Lord. And be sure, your sin will find you out. You see that? Be sure, your sin will find you out. I know, I realize that that passage, that phrase from that one verse has probably been used so much by modern day free will preachers and they're basically telling men and women today that if you're out behind the building smoking cigarettes but you know you really shouldn't then God's going to get you one day this ain't about cigarettes like our beloved pastor Earl Cochran used to say there's some preachers that preach more against a pack of cigarettes and a can of beer than they do for the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ this ain't about sins in general what did he say? Be sure your sin, a singular sin. What is that sin? Not engaging in the battle with the rest of God's people. Well, I just want to be a believer and sit at home. I can read my Bible. I can watch the internet. Yes, you can. But if you're God's people, you will join in the battle with God's people. That's what this book teaches. That's what our chapter is teaching us. You see, God's church is one church. There's only one church. It is one people. We are one people united to Christ by one God-wrought calling. And you can see that clearly if you wish later to turn to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1 and 6, where it says things like one Lord, right? One faith, one baptism, one hope of his calling. All of one, one, one. Why? Because we are one people. If you are a member of the church, it means God has called you out of the world, placed you in the church, and the church is people. The church is people. And whether they meet in a remodeled house, or whether they eat uh, meet in some great citadel somewhere, or whether they meet in a cave somewhere, you will desire to be with God's people if you've been called out of Egypt into the wilderness. You will engage in the battle. Isn't it amazing? All of these tribes, with the 12 of them, with their stiff neckness. Oh, Paul, that might not be a word either. <laughs> and their rebellion against God. Yet I don't find one tribe saying, we're going to leave the group and go on our own. You've ever noticed that? You know why? Because God ordained, he made us this way. Whether it's in our natural state or our spiritual state, we need other people. Yeah. We need, a, and if you think you don't, you are, you have deceived yourself. I mean, even the great prophet said, Lord, I'm, I'm all alone. Didn't he? Yeah. Boy, don't we like to have those pity parties? Oh, it's just, boy, I'm the only one standing true for God. God told him, no, nah, i got 7,000. Well, now, you don't know about You know about them now, but I've got 7,000 men that have, I have reserved, and they've not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. You see, God's holy, wise, sovereign purpose separates his own, not only from the world in heart and mind, but from each other geographically. Even here in this small group of people, some of us drive almost an hour to get here. And I don't know how many times people have asked me, you go that far to go to church? And I wish I always had the appropriate response, no, I am going together with the church. And it takes me that long to get there. Because there are very few places in this world where the truth of the person and work of Jesus Christ is proclaimed without apology. Nowhere is the truth and the, per and the work of Jesus Christ proclaimed perfectly. But there are some groups of people 
that by God Almighty's grace, they strive to preach the truth of the person and work of Jesus Christ faithfully from this book in spite of their faults and their failures. I would love if all of God's people were together. But we'd be just like Israel. Wouldn't we? Yeah. Be just like we'd be at one another's throats in a heartbeat. Hmm? Again, I say God's wise, holy, sovereign purpose separates us not only from the world, but from each other geographically. geographically. And his purpose separates us to distinct difficulties difficulties you I'm not going to read it but you can read that if you read verse 30 or chapter 32 verses 33 through 42 you find out that Gad Reuben and the half tribe of Manasseh had their own particular battles to fight on their side did they not you read that you find but one thing they must do is engage the battle with the rest of God's people think about it the church at Corinth and the church at Thessalonica was one. They were God's one church. Mason, they were one church. But they were still separate churches geographically. And the same problems at Corinth were not all the same problems at Thessalonica. Right? I mean, Paul had to give strong rebuke to immorality in Corinth. He warns Thessalonica about immorality but gives no specific re, uh, rebuke paul had to rebuke an individual in corinth and the rest of the believers at corinth were putting up with what was going on yeah. he didn't do that to thessalonica because that wasn't going on in thessalonica but there was one battle common to both those churches geographically one battle what battle was that the preaching of the gospel of the person and work of Jesus Christ. That is common to every local assembly. There are some assemblies, ones of which I am familiar. There are more, I have no doubt, because I don't know all the people of God. But there are some who may have one, two hundred people, and I guarantee you some of their problems are far more complex than just our small group here. Don't you figure so? I mean, the more of us wicked, corrupt, rebellious stiff-necked people you put together the worse we screw things up and make it for everything else yeah. and there are times when I become discouraged but then I look out here over this small group and I say thank God thank God think of it the seven churches of Asia now they were God's one church were they not those who were actually called out called it they were one church yet all seven churches had various, various things going on but who's the one head of all those seven churches? Jesus Christ the Lord. You see, and yet, yet the battle is common to all. I read it, verses 20, 21, 22, 23, specifically. That battle is the truth of the gospel. Look at verse 6. Let's read that. Remember, Gad and Reuben can say, this is great land over here for our, for our animals. This is great land. This would work well for us. Moses says, that's fine. But you look out, but look what he says, verse 6. And Moses said unto the children of Gad and to the children of Reuben, Shall your brethren go to war? And he said here. Now here's the question. And I, I, I could ask it. I can't point at individuals and say, You're this one, you're I can't do that. But I must stand here and warn. I must admonish. I must rebuke. Are they really your brethren if you're not willing to get in the heat of the battle with them? Yeah. Hmm? Now, come on now. I mean, if I tell my wife I love her, but I don't want to spend time with her because I'm afraid I might get the COVID. Now, I don't mean this to be mean, but my wife and I still lived in the same house when one of us had it. My wife and I still ate the same food when one of us had it, and the other one didn't. My wife and I still slept in the same bed when one of us had it, and the other didn't. And why? Because why? Because we just believe God so much? No, because it's nonsense to think you can separate yourself from someone you love. And if you don't want to be here with us, and you're close enough you could be with us, the reason you're not here with us is because you don't love us. Because you're not willing to engage in the battle with us. 
And you think, what do I do for the Lord? You show up at this small group every Sunday that you possibly can. And that says to people around you, you, you might not, they might not say it to you, but they know that person's weird. They, they're really connected to that weird group of folks over there in that place called Sovereign Grace Chapel. Huh? That's right. I mean, I went. I went to a place one time, I think I've told you this, went to a place one time, I was supposed to get me a free camera. If you listen for a spiel to buy some property. So I thought, well, I'll go get me a free camera. I didn't get me a free camera. You know why? Because the subject of religion came up. I didn't bring it up. I was wanting my free camera. I knew that would probably stifle the free camera. This individual who had control over the free camera Brought the subject up. Now, once the subject is broached, Ellen, what must I do? Speak the truth of God in Jesus Christ. And he said, well, why do you drive all the way to Beckley? I said, because it's all heretics down in Mercer County. But I didn't get my free camera. <laughs> After that, I wasn't worried about the free camera. People will find out the truth about you if you engage in the war with your brothers and sisters. You don't have to stand behind the podium to do it. Do it where you work. Do it where you live. Do it online. But make sure that the battle you're fighting is concerning the person and work of Jesus Christ. Not once saved, always saved. Did you know that's not the battle? Because once God convinces a man or a woman or a boy or a girl, black or white, rich, bond free, male or female, once God convinces an individual of the absolute efficacy of the person or work of Jesus Christ, they ain't worried about the subject of once saved, always saved anymore. They will rec begin to recognize that they have been safe since the world began. Since the world began and God called them out of the world and placed them amidst his people so they know in this world God's done this for me. Hmm. Yet that one battle is common to all. That battle is the truth of the gospel. It is preach Christ, preach Christ, preach Christ. If you argue with people about whether you ought to have a musical instrument or not have a musical instrument, you have went off on the cusp. You're out there fighting a the battle on the east side of Jordan and leaving your brethren over here who's preaching the person and work of Jesus Christ. And it's just that simple. We should be gathered on the Sabbath day or on the first day of the week. That's not the battle. Do you understand that? That's not the battle. I could get along with a local assembly that believed it was better to meet on Friday evening sometime 6 o'clock basin to Saturday evening sometime 6 o'clock if they preach the truth of the person and work of Jesus Christ. If I didn't have a place to go, I'd meet with them on the Sabbath day and not on the first day of the week. If they're preaching the truth of the person and work of Jesus Christ. Because that's where the battle is. So my title is this, Gospel Called, Gospel Gathered, gospel-centered assemblies. And if you don't find yourself there, then you've never been gospel-called. Do you hear what I just said? Gospel-called, gospel-gathered. Gospel-called, oh, I believe the truth. But I, you know, it's, it's just too much trouble to have to get up every Sunday morning. It's too difficult. I work late Saturday nights. It's just too difficult. Gospel called, gospel gathered. The word church means called out. But it means called unto an assembly. Called unto a congregation. As a matter of fact, one of the words used in the Old Testament where it talks about the congregation the writer of Hebrews translates that word in Hebrews, congregation, he translates it this way, church. Church. This building is not the church. This building is Sovereign Grace Chapel. These people who gather here and believe Christ, they are the church. They are the church. The war is defined by Paul. Turn to Romans chapter 1. Let me move along. Romans chapter 1. This war is defined. Now here is an apostle. Here is a man 
who was taught personally by Jesus Christ. Mason, as any apostle, must have been to be an apostle. You had to be personally under the ministry of Jesus Christ to be an apostle. Saul of Tarsus was one he called himself born out of due time. But Jesus Christ taught him personally. He went into Arabia by himself, and he didn't seek man's opinion. And there, God Almighty taught him his gospel. And Mason, I believe he used the Old Testament scripture to do it with. Because he just wasn't getting it out of thin air. Because God's truth, the gospel of Jesus Christ's person and work, is as much in the Old Testament as it is in the New Testament. The word's defined. Here's an apostle. Paul, a servant of who? Not the church. Hmm. Not the mission board. Right? Paul, a servant of who? Jesus Christ. Called an apostle. Now, to be doesn't destroy it, but it may convolute a little. He wasn't called to be an apostle. He was called an apostle. Separated unto what? Separate unto what? What is now? We're separated from a lot of things. And we're separated to a lot of things. But where is the battle? That's what I'm getting at. What is the hub of all of these other spokes that go out to make up the whole of the wheel? What's the hub of all of it? Separated unto the gospel of God. And this wasn't some new thing, Paul says. Which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. And now it's even more compartmentalized concerning his son. Jesus Christ our Lord. I don't say this to beat a dead horse, as folks say, but there are people, there are local assemblies, groups, or a, a local assembly. They have split and, and splintered because of musical instruments. Or whether you ought to wash feet when you have the Lord's table. Or whether when you have the Lord's table, is it only for members of that local assembly or any? There are so-called churches, Mason, that have split because of things like that. And the real reason is they really don't believe and agree concerning the truth of the person and work of Jesus Christ. And I mean by that, they think it's important, but it's not all important. These other things are just as important. What was Gad and Reuben told? Over here on this side, over on the west side of Jordan, there's the battle. And you don't fight with your brethren, be sure this, your sin will find you out. It's defined concerning his son, Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh and declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. And he's not done with this yet. Look at by whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. This ain't just the way it is for one local assembly. This is the way it is for all the local assemblies over all the face of the earth. Jesus Christ is the sum and substance of all things. Again, the war now was made public. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And you know it. Let me just... Let me just look at verse 17. I've got to move on. For Christ sent me not to baptize. Do you know there are people who make baptism the matter of contention? How you do it, how you don't do it. Whether you got to do it or whether you don't got to do it. Am I telling you the facts or what? Or not? But Paul said, Christ did not send me to baptize. He's not throwing off on baptism. But everything's got to be in its proper perspective. You exalt anything even attempt to exalt anything to be equal with or even right under the absolute necessity of the truth of the person and work of Jesus Christ, it is idolatry. You can make baptism and it can become, you can make baptism essential, you make it to be your idol. Christ sent me not to baptize, but to do what? Preach the gospel. You know what he says? Now I, by God's grace, I want to stand with Paul. Mason, I want to fight that battle. Now there may be battles to fight against baptism. 
Man comes along and says, well, so-and-so baptized me. Who cares? Right? Paul deals with that, doesn't he? Well, I was baptized in the old church. So what? Unto what were you baptized? Well, I was baptized face down. Well, whoop-dee-doo. Well, I, it, was, it was said, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, not Jesus only when I was baptized. Do you really think that's going to make, that's what it's all about? Baptism is what? The answer of a good conscience before God. And this book bears out that we baptize by immersing in water. And it don't matter whether it's front forward or back, fo back first, front first or back first. It don't matter. Dipped one time or three. There are people who argue over that. Yeah. Well, at least we all believe in dipping. We can get along on that, don't we? Hmm. What does he say? Let's go on. For the preaching of, look at verse 18. No, I, I didn't read all. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the what? Now here's the gospel. The cross of Christ should be made of none effect. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. The preaching of baptism is not it. We instruct in baptism, but we preach Christ. We instruct concerning the truth of the law, the facts given in the law, but our preaching is what? The person and work of Jesus Christ. We encourage men and women not to forsake the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is. And why is that? Because we need one another's companionship and help. And if you don't, then that means you're not a part of the group. Plain and simple. For it is written, for it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. I will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? And note, God does not deny this wisdom in men. Because Jack Meadows, God gave men and women this wisdom. But men and women abuse that wisdom. Men and you, women use that wisdom to stroke their own egos and their own sense of self-worth. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? God help us. Let's quit arguing with people about things. Tell them about Jesus Christ and who he really is. Because until God opens their eyes, and their ears and the hearts to see him I don't care how orthodox they are on every other subject they've missed him whom to have his life where is the wise where is the scribe where is the disputer of this world hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world that's a conundrum is it not for after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching. Now let me ask you, do you preach to yourself? I didn't ask you if you talk to yourself. I know some of us probably talk to ourselves. No, preaching is a public thing. Whether you're a person sent by God to stand in a specific office like it is right here or whether you're doing it on Facebook with somebody over the internet or whether you're talking with someone at work or whether you're talking with someone at Walmart it is to proclaim now this ain't about pastoring it's preaching pastors are to preach and teach okay they're to be pastors and teachers but preaching is different than pastoring Preaching, it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. And somebody said, but preacher, we're preaching. I mean, we're on the internet, we're on TV, and just nobody's believing. It's because God ain't ordained one to believe right now. Is that right or wrong? That's right. Noah preached for 120 years. And he preached God's righteousness for 120 years. And only seven other people of all the millions, if not billions of people that were on the face of the earth at that time. And only seven others were allowed by God to enter into the ark. Yes. Noah's preaching was for the sake of those seven other people and the glory of God. For the Jews require a sign, the Greeks seek after wisdom, and it's still so today. 
The religious person says, prove what you're saying to me. That's the Jews seeking a sign, is it not? Prove what you're saying from that Bible is true. I don't have to prove it. I just preach it. You don't have to prove it. Just preach it. Just say what this says. You don't have to even explain it. I think we pastors think we're so great at explaining everything else when nobody else can, and our ego strokes itself like no one's business. For the Jews require a sign. The Greeks seek after wisdom. What does the intelligent, educated person say? Bring me all of the evidence that you can. I need empirical evidence. Prove this mathematically and scientifically. I had a guy come into my house one time to sell me. I think it was insurance. And of course he was in my own home. And in my own home, I would speak about what I wanted to speak about. So I was not quiet about the person, the work of Jesus Christ, like I was when I was trying to get the free camera. And when I started talking about the person, the work of Jesus Christ, he wanted to start showing me mathematics. Now, folks, I am not kidding you. And he sat for 10 minutes. But you need to see this. This will open your mind. I said, mathematics don't open your mind. God does. And he don't, uh, I mean, I watched on YouTube, God help you on you, where one and one actually can equal zero. And this great mathematician was showing how it's so. And after it was over, I thought, he's an idiot. He's an idiot. Yeah, he was proving with mathematics how one and one's not just two, but it can be zero. And I thought, boy. These are the people that are teaching our young folks in our schools now. Mm. But we preach what? What is it we preach? If we're preaching the gospel, Christ crucified. And there's the problem. Because you could preach about baptism, you could preach about church membership, you could preach about the Lord's table, you could preach you could preach about feet watching, you can preach about musical instruments or no musical instruments, and you will find somebody else that will agree with you somewhere. But no man by nature agrees to who Jesus Christ really is and what he actually accomplished until God Almighty opens up their eyes and their ears and their heart. You see, the war, this one war, is preeminent. Paul told the Corinthians that when he first came to them, he determined to know nothing among them save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I know that may sound, because a lot of us preachers, those we're associated with, we say this a lot, but think about who the Corinthians were. It was the center of, a center of great commerce, Mason. A center of great religious worship. Temples everywhere. The, the, it was one of the centers of the world at that time of great pleasures in the world. And immorality ran rampant in that city. And when Paul come in, what did he preach? What did he stick to? Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's the context of what he was writing there. When he wrote to the Corinthians, he warned them about immorality, did he not? He warned them about whether you ought to, if you're, you're a believer, and, and, you're, and, and if you're a believer, you ought not marry someone that's an unbeliever. You're just asking for nothing but trouble. Didn't he warn them about that? But what's the one message? Jesus Christ and him crucified. Let me move on. Has this war ever been defined and made public and made preeminent to you, to me? There are people who have been in this assembly. Listen to either Joe or Paul or B or others who and they come in, boy, no, they just tears come down. Oh, they just know they're a sinner. Hmm? But have they come to that point in time where they're ready to engage in the battle with the people of God? Paul, according to his writing in 2 Corinthians 10, verses 3 through 5, God will come in with the weapons of our warfare, which are not carnal. They're not carnal, but they're mighty through God. And they do what? They pull down strongholds. 
They cast down what men think up here about themselves and about God. Casting down imaginations. And it brings every thought into the obedience of God. Christ. It makes you begin to think about the person and work of Jesus Christ. When you go to work and you're stocking a shelf, all of a sudden Christ and who he is and what he accomplished pops into your mind, does it not? Hmm. But that is not so with those who give lip service to God only. A good Calvinist is only saved if he believes Jesus Christ. And an Arminian can be saved if God brings him or her to believe Jesus Christ. The gospel is the battle. The gospel is not righteous people can be called, gathered, and gospel-centered. God's never called not one righteous person in this world. Did you know that? Christ said, I didn't come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And listen to me. People that may hear this later, maybe hear it now or maybe later. The battle for the people of God is not against the beer joints and the strip clubs and the gambling parlors, parlors and all the, all the dope fiends and all. That's not where the battle's at. Those are the people that need to hear the personal work of Jesus Christ. Like I said, I've never had one drunk, anytime I ever talked to one, I've never had one drunk get mad at me because of the truth of the personal work of Jesus Christ. They may not have believed what I said, but Mason, I never had one get mad at me. Let me change it. I did have one get mad at me. It was at a golf course one time. He was so drunk he couldn't even hardly walk. But he was an ex-free will Baptist preacher, so there you go. Hmm? Had he been a drunk laying in a ditch underneath some overpass somewhere, he probably would have said, Preacher, what you're saying may well be right, but I can't help myself. Don't you think? Mm -hmm. You know where the battle's at? The battle is with the pride and the righteousness that man has down here in his heart and heart in his mind. That's where the battle's at. You see, the gospel is Christ, 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 Christ. If you say, if you think within yourself, well, I think Walter got a little off kilter over here on this thing. Just coming and hammering on me about that thing will never accomplish one thing. Here's what's going to accomplish it. I will, I will end with this. Colossians chapter 2. For I would that ye knew what great conflict I had for you. What have we, we've been talking about? A battle, right? The war. What great conflict I have for you and for them at... Look at that word right there. Do you see what? Laodicea. You remember Laodicea? That's the local assembly, one of the local assemblies in Asia that Christ said, I'm going to vomit you up out of my mouth. Look, and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh, that their hearts might be comforted, be knit together in love, and unto all riches of full assurance of understanding to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. But, but preacher, I got this one book and it just has such great insight. If it's not about the person and work of Jesus Christ, it don't have no great insight. It may, be, may well be that thing that leads your soul straight to hell. For though I be absent in the flesh, yet I am with you in the spirit, joying and beholding your order, and, your, and the steadfastness of what? Your faith in Christ. As ye therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, how are you going to walk then? So walk ye in him. And I'm going to tell you, if the preaching of the personal work of Jesus Christ doesn't stir you up to serve God, then you do not know God. I don't care what you profess. I don't care where you think you are. I don't care how long you've attended this place. If the preaching of the person and work of Jesus Christ doesn't stir you up in your soul, you've missed Jesus Christ. Yeah. Rooted and built up. How? In Him. And established in the faith as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. 
And as I beware lest any man spoil you. You know what that means, don't you? What is it when something spoils? It's made to rot. Correct? Made to rot. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and empty deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Since that is true, what is it that will motivate me outside of that? Hmm? There is nothing else. Mason, would you close us in prayer, please?